what are you gonna do about it? Nothing. I just want you to face me so she could get behind you. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at shows with a single season that was strong enough to leave a lasting impact. Whether they were cancelled too soon or were brief by design, these shows made the best of what little airtime they had. Don't you push your button now. Sorry. Number 20. The Dark Crystal – Age of Resistance Success has always come slowly to the Dark Crystal franchise. Jim Henson's 1982 passion project wasn't a huge financial or critical hit, but has since become a fantasy classic. Henson would have been proud to see his creation inspire this prequel series, which maintains the spirit of its predecessor with mostly practical effects and a harsh yet hopeful tone. There you are. I was afraid you got lost. <laughs> You cheated. Age of Resistance is arguably even stronger in terms of character, themes, and world building, calling Game of Thrones to mind. You and I are better than that. <sighs> You're right. <sighs> it might not be as violent as that fantasy series, but it's just as intense and dramatically compelling. Days after winning an Emmy, Netflix canceled the series. With any luck, Age of Resistance 2 will gain a cult following, opening the door for a return to Thra. Perhaps it hides in the dream space. What's that? Number 19. The Prisoner Where American shows are notorious for dragging things out until no longer profitable, British television is inclined to bow out while ahead. Yet some shows leave such a large imprint in pop culture that you'd swear they were on longer. I suppose you're wondering what you're doing here. It had crossed my mind. The Prisoner, for example, is draped in iconic imagery, from the village's bicycle logo to the mysterious rover, aka that big white balloon. <laughs> the series wrapped up after 17 episodes, going down as one of the earliest cult shows. It'd also leave audiences on arguably the first controversial series finale, which is essentially what creator-slash-star Patrick McGowan aimed for. The ending further ensured that Number 6's story would be remembered and revisited. In that sense, the village truly is impossible to escape. You are the only individual. We need you. I see. Number 18. Forever. When a show is titled Forever, the creators were probably setting themselves up for irony. Even so, audiences weren't ready to say goodbye to Henry Morgan after 22 episodes. So, detective, what conclusions can you draw? The series followed a Sherlock-esque doctor played by Yoan Griffith, who's died more times than Kenny on South Park. Also like Kenny, Henry can't seem to stay dead, spending two centuries trying to unravel the mystery of his immortality. Since that night nearly two centuries ago, every time I die, I always return in water. Although the critical reception was mixed, Forever found a passionate following. Despite performing well in terms of DVR viewership, low live ratings were at the root of Forever's cancellation. A fan campaign wasn't enough to save it, but we suppose Henry finally got what he wanted, a chance to rest in peace. The memories are forever, however. Not all of us can live forever. Apologies, Abraham. Number 17. When They See Us If they're innocent, then why would they confess? Ignorant questions like this epitomize why the Central Park Five, now the Exonerated Five, are just a small fraction of the countless individuals who've been wrongfully incarcerated due to a mix of racial profiling, forced confessions, and a broken system. Kevin did it. By the end of this miniseries' first episode, the audience is sure to be left shocked, heartbroken, and enraged. I don't want us like this. These feelings only intensify as director Ava DuVernay continues to peel back the layers of injustice. Just as integral, DuVernay hones in on each accused young man and their family, reminding us that behind the one-sided news coverage, these are all human beings. Each performance drips with raw humanity, especially Jarrell Jerome in an Emmy-winning turn. All right. I don't know what you mean! All right, come on, let's go, kid. Don't touch me! Don't touch me! Number 16. Mayor of Easttown 
Kate Winslet also won an Emmy for her bold performance as Detective Mare Sheehan. Had Mare of Easttown been condensed into a feature, it might have won her another Oscar. Hey, you good? I'm good. Welcome. This material works better as a miniseries, though, allowing more time to explore Mare's personal life and inner turmoil. A mystery surrounding the death of a young mother hooks us in, but we can see setups like that in any police procedural. There's only one Mare Sheehan, who's consumed by grief, disappointment, and a sense that her best years are long in the past. I can't even remember which ones. Solving this murder may bring Mare some closure, although it will also open the door to more tragedy. While Winslet is open to doing another season, some cases are better left closed. Oh my god. There she goes. Number 15. Profit. People often point to Tony Soprano as the one who popularized anti-heroes on TV. Fox could have beaten HBO to the punchline three years earlier if only they had given Profit the time to find its audience. It hurts too much to be around you. The show was already on its way to doing so, with critics praising Profit as a breath of fresh air. Maybe too fresh for mainstream viewers, who weren't sure how to feel about ruthless protagonist Jim Profit, played by Adrian Pastar. You know what? You're right. This amounted to low ratings, with Fox just airing four of the eight completed episodes. The other half later surfaced on the now-defunct Trio Network. A classic case of being ahead of its time, Profit foreshadowed a media landscape where anti-heroes are cheered on rather than condemned. Bobby, this isn't the time or the place for this. Number 14. Normal People Daisy Edgar Jones and Paul Meskel have broken out as two of our most promising stars. Normal People marked a significant turning point in their careers, making for one of the most fleshed out pairs we've seen in any medium. That was nice. Edgar Jones plays social outcast Marianne, and Paul Meskel is popular athlete Connell. The two enter a sexual relationship with deeper feelings buried beneath the social pressures that prompt them to keep things on the down low. I hope you don't find it too hard trying to resist me. Normal People is much smarter and more mature than one would expect from a teen drama, watching these two grow individually and as a couple. Life continually gets in the way of their complicated relationship. Whether or not they're soulmates, Marianne and Connell wouldn't reach their final destinations without each other. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. No. <laughs> Number 13. Vinyl. The Vinyl pilot was directed by Martin Scorsese, its all-star cast was headlined by Bobby Cannavale, and the creatives involved included Terrence Winter and Mick Jagger. By all accounts, Vinyl should have been HBO's next big hit, so much so that they invested $100 million in season one, with a second season order all lined up. You ever think about getting something in writing? The Krauts, they think the deal's done. HBO reversed this decision two months after the season finale, which subsequently became the series finale. I thought you said it went well over there. It did. Now I gotta go fix it. Even if the show didn't hit the ground running as some might have anticipated, there was potential that could have been expanded beyond 10 episodes. With first-rate production values, strong performances, and a distinct 70s sound, the series had all the right pieces except for one. Time to get its funk on. Which, let's face it, is what it's all about. <laughs> Number 12. Wonderfalls. Brian Fuller is a one-of-a-kind talent, but his shows are lucky if they get two or three seasons. Wonder Falls only got one, although it packed in more wit and whimsy into 13 episodes than most syndicated shows possess in their entirety. I'm confused. Fuller's inventive storytelling wonderfully complements the visual energy of fellow creator Todd Holland, who worked on Malcolm in the Middle. Caroline Deverna is a delight as Jay, a sarcastic gift shop clerk who finds herself being hounded by muses, which materializes as animal objects. Word of advice, don't give her money back. Fox didn't give this highly imaginative show a chance, pulling the plug after four episodes. Fans eventually got to see the full season on DVD, but if we had a penny in a fountain, we'd wish for a revival. No more talking from things that don't talk, we had a deal. Number 11, Midnight Mass. Some people find religion comforting. 
If you dig into some of the darker themes and concepts, though, any religion can start to sound like a horror story. Love rises again, even out of sin. And this island, it will rise again. Creator Mike Flanagan blurs the lines between the Bible and a Bram Stoker novel in a wholly original work of supernatural terror. Vampirism aside, Midnight Mass unearths real-world horror as the citizens of Crockett Island begin to adopt a cult-like mentality. Fear not, fear not, be not afraid! This gothic miniseries doesn't outright scapegoat religion as the villain. Flanagan, who was brought up Catholic before becoming an atheist, unpacks his personal experiences in a story that explores how religion's flaws stem from humanity. Whether using religion to inspire or control, people can be driven to do the unspeakable when they unwaveringly cling to their beliefs. No! <laughs> Number 10. Over the Garden Wall Throughout the past decade, Over the Garden Wall has developed into a Halloween tradition in the spirit of the Great Pumpkin. When this miniseries first aired, it almost crept up on us with its Halloween theme. And what about you? You sure you want to leave? Me? Yes. Oh, well, you'll join us someday. While there's an eerie vibe and autumn atmosphere from the get-go, Halloween ultimately plays a larger role in the narrative and character development than anticipated. It goes to show that behind any mask, there might be something you missed before. Don't you know the beast is afoot here? The beast? We, we, we don't know anything about that. We we're just two lost kids trying to get home. That said, we always notice something new whenever we revisit Patrick McHale's Emmy winning creation. Repeat viewings shouldn't be restricted to October either. From its playful music to its simple yet layered world building, Over the Garden Wall is a satisfying, not to mention quick, watch any time of the year. And so the story is complete and everyone is satisfied with the ending, and so on and so forth. Number 9. The Queen's Gambit Beth Harmon's life is a game of chess. Jesus Christ, Harmon, you're humiliating my rook. You won't have to suffer much longer. She's a character who keeps everything on the inside, visualizing her next move with an enigmatic look on her face. Beating her at the chessboard is one thing. The real challenge is breaking through Beth's emotional defenses. Even as Beth grows more confident, something is holding her back from forming meaningful attachments. Vices such as pills and liquor escalate Beth's obsession with being the best, which may destroy the queen before she can be crowned. Anya Taylor-Joy's quiet yet multifaceted performance, paired with Scott Frank's vivid direction, would mold the Queen's Gambit into a phenomenon, speaking to audiences at a time when isolation was at its peak. It also made chess the most fashionable strategy game. So good I am. Number 8. My So-Called Life at a time when most teen dramas were dominated by soap opera storylines and very special episodes, Winnie Holtzman delivered a surprisingly grounded and adult show entitled My So-Called Life. You know, in my humble opinion. If Holtzman's name sounds familiar, that might be because she went on to scribe Wicked. She isn't the only one who continued to ascend following the show's sole season. It served as a breakthrough for rising stars like Jared Leto and Claire Danes the latter of whom won a Golden Globe for breathing life into the angsty Angela. Why are you like this? Like what? Like how you are. Just as the show tapped into a turning point in Angela's coming of age journey, the show saw the teen drama come of age. Perhaps it was too real for the 90s, proving to be ahead of the class. See you, Brian. See ya. Number seven, Police Squad. We're all familiar with the Naked Gun trilogy, but even longtime fans of these classic comedies are often surprised to learn that the franchise started as a TV series. Police Squad assembled all of the essential players, including the Zuckers, Jim Abrams, and star Leslie Nielsen. The following morning, I reported back to Police Squad. The series possessed the over-the-top visual gags and silly yet witty puns we'd come to associate with the films. So why did ABC force the series into early retirement after six episodes? Because it had fast-paced humor that required viewers to pay attention, which audiences were incapable of in 1982. Well, it doesn't sound to me like you were very sure Terry was going to say yes. Hey! Thankfully, film audiences had wider attention spans with TV audiences eventually catching up. 
Police Squad is like a lost fourth naked gun movie that fortunately isn't lost at all. All right, here you go. Gotta go. Good luck, Mr. DeWonderful. Number six, Band of Brothers. In 1999, Saving Private Ryan lost the Best Picture Oscar to Shakespeare in Love. Many factors contributed to this infamous upset, a standout argument being that Shakespeare played better on voters' TV screens than Steven Spielberg's war epic. Band of Brothers, which reunited Spielberg and Tom Hanks behind the scenes, feels like a retaliation against that argument. Captain, you've just been killed, along with 95% of your company. Yes, the screen was smaller, but Band of Brothers stands out as one of the most intense, immersive, and powerful depictions of World War I. Get those MGs moving, will ya? Now more than ever, people describe miniseries as movies with longer run times. It's debatable if this started with Band of Brothers, but it certainly set a cinematic standard that would be carried on in other HBO miniseries like The Pacific. I've been chasing geese, boys. It's the fifth Marines on the airfield. Number five, Watchmen. An HBO miniseries based on a game-changing graphic novel sounds phenomenal, but fans were initially skeptical. For starters, Watchmen would be a sequel rather than a straightforward adaptation. Are you okay? The show was also subjected to early review bombing concerning the character Rorschach. Those who took the time to watch the whole series found that developer, Damon Lindelof, more than did the source material justice. He surpassed it in some respects, expanding upon the world with the introduction of new masked figures and the return of several key figures. May God have mercy on your soul. God. Your gods abandon you. The casting across the board is pitch perfect, making the story feel plausible even at its most extraordinary. Its blend of classic themes and fresh ideas strikes a balance that few other reimaginings come close to achieving. You've kept this secret all this time, and now you're having misgivings. Number four, Chernobyl. When a tragedy like Chernobyl occurs, people are compelled to say, never forget. Unfortunately, many did forget, as explained through this haunting miniseries. The backup pumps running, we need water moving through the cord, that is all that matters. There is no cord. Numerous viewers weren't even aware of Chernobyl before Craig Mazin's dramatization hit the screen. Even if they knew the name Chernobyl, people might have underestimated the disaster's scale and how easily it could have been avoided, or at least better contained. Chernobyl is a daunting reminder of how the unthinkable can become reality. But I don't know if I can make things better for you. But I can certainly make them worse. Case in point, less than a year after the series premiered, COVID gave us nightmares of Chernobyl on a global scale. While it thankfully didn't come to that, this miniseries remains a grim yet essential watch, guaranteeing we'll never forget Chernobyl or the human errors that can lead to similar events. But if you don't, Millions will die. Number three, The Honeymooners. With a working class protagonist, an outspoken wife, and a dim-witted best friend, The Honeymooners is still inspiring sitcoms almost 70 years later. It's somewhat staggering that such an influential show lasted a season consisting of 39 episodes. What would you like, Ralph? Lemonade or uh, milk or juice? Let me have what you're drinking. I want to get loaded, too. <laughs> this wasn't a case of the network prematurely axing a groundbreaking show. Jackie Gleason signed on for 78 episodes spread over two seasons. After 39 episodes, Gleason felt the show would dip in quality if he continued, reaching an agreement with CBS to end it. The sitcom initially wasn't the biggest ratings hit anyway, but Gleason underestimated just how valuable his creation would be down the line. Gleason sold the series, and along with its lucrative syndication rights, for $1.5 million, which sounds like a Ralph Cramden movie. Wait a minute, you're making a mistake! I made the mistake 15 years ago. Number two, Freaks and Geeks. Freaks and Geeks is a bit like John Hughes if you removed any of the romanticized elements. I have as much right to be here as you do. There are no spontaneous musical numbers on parade floats, but the characters and conversations couldn't be more authentic to the teenage experience, especially if you were an outsider. 
From behind the scenes talents like Paul Feig and Judd Apatow to a cast that featured Linda Cardellini and Seth Rogen, it's hard to think of anyone associated with this project who didn't go on to have a prominent career. Hey, Lindsay. Hey, nice threads. Nice voice. <laughs> hey, uh, Sergeant Pepper, where's the rest of the Lonely Hearts Club band? The show was lightning in a bottle that's never quite been replicated, although the similarly short-lived Undeclared came close. We could be angry about its cancellation, but we're mostly grateful for the 18 episodes we got and how they're still shaping us. I'll see you soon. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Firefly In an alternate reality, the space western lasted several seasons, inspired multiple spin-offs, and got a Disneyland attraction following the Fox merger. Instead, Fox banished Firefly to Friday nights, aired episodes out of order, and canceled the series after 11 of its 14 finished episodes. You're later than I'd like. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Firefly was far from out of gas, continuing to attract more brown coats with its intricate world building, quotable dialogue, and characters who feel real, leading to a theatrical film that provided some closure. Between Joss Whedon's recent controversy and much of the cast moving on to other projects, rumors of a Firefly revival might be the internet getting their hopes up, but the spark hasn't gone out yet. Yeah, look, here's what it is. Deal's off. We changed our minds. For now, it remains a testament of how far one season can go. What do we plan to do about this? Well, that's the question. What's your favorite one season show? Would you bring any of these back for a second? Let us know in the comments. No, they, they, they all said they loved it. You didn't hire me to tell you what they said. You hired me to tell you the truth. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from Watch Mojo and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.